Hey guys, I'm Siobhan, a third year medical resident. Today, we'll be tackling an issue that's close to my heart, and that's healthcare providers who have contracted COVID-19. Out of all the patients, 10 to 15% of them are healthcare workers. So are we just not protecting ourselves properly? We're gonna tackle this question head on, and I've invited Dr. Rishi Desai, the former epidemic intelligence officer for the CDC and infectious disease doctor, to give his opinion. You may recognize him from the viral video when he was on Fox News. There are many factors that go into why healthcare providers are catching COVID-19. One of the most important ones is how much virus the person is exposed to. So your body has natural defense mechanisms. And if you're exposed to a small amount of virus, you have a better chance of fighting off that infection. Let's see what Dr. Desai had to say about this. In general, especially younger, healthier healthcare workers in general, shouldn't be getting sick at these, at these levels, but they're around people that are very sick, are literally, in some cases, coughing in their face, and they're getting repeated inoculums. So I might get a high inoculum from person A, a medium from person B, another high one from person C. By the end of the day, I've had maybe 10 inoculums. So that night, I'm dealing with something that's far different than the casual grocery store visitor who might have wiped an apple and, and caught a little bit of virus off that apple because two days ago someone coughed on it. It's a totally different ball of wax. And so the amount of virus that I'm getting as a healthcare worker is therefore going to put me at much higher risk. So clearly we need to reduce the exposure, the number of exposures that healthcare providers have to the virus. And that's where PPE comes on board, personal protective equipment. That's everything from gloves, goggles, masks, gowns. It's what keeps us safe. There's been a lot of discussion about personal protective equipment in the media. And the big questions are, what kind of masks should we be wearing? And what do we do with these shortages that we're seeing? It's so heartbreaking to see healthcare providers that aren't properly equipped, especially seeing nurses in New York wearing garbage bags. So if you have healthcare workers out there because their, their hospital said, you know, go out there and use this one mask for the week or for the month, and that's all they have, they're wearing it, maybe there's a leak, maybe that thing is starting to break down, maybe it's soiled, it's not even working right, and yet they're forced to wear it day in, day out. It's not like they're just getting these high inoculums, they're getting them on top of not having right adequate protection. There's been a debate about whether we need surgical masks or N95 masks. And this all comes down to whether we think the coronavirus is transmitted by droplet or aerosolized procedure. Let me explain. The difference between droplets and aerosols is just about the size. So droplets are bigger and then they fall faster out of the air, whereas aerosols are small and they can stay suspended in the air. So surgical masks were originally designed to prevent surgeons from contaminating patients and reducing wound infections. But now we're using the surgical mask to protect ourselves. And that's something that we actually haven't studied that much. But overall, we know that it stops bigger particles. On the other hand, N95s are designed to stop 95% of particles in the air, and that includes the small particles. Science tells us that infections can't easily be put into boxes like droplets or aerosols. It's probably somewhere in between, a combination of both. We know from some studies that coronavirus is found in the air around sick people. So what we don't know is will those viruses found in the air, are they able to infect people? We don't know if they're still viable and that's why we need more research. This explains why health authorities like the CDC or the World Health Organization have created a list of medical procedures that are most likely to create those tiny particles. And we're using N95 masks in those scenarios because they're such a, a scarce resource. For me, I mean, right now, often what's being seen in the hospital is you wear a surgical mask and unless there's an aerosolizing procedure, then you put it on N95. I can't help but wonder sometimes when I'm walking into a room patient has just coughed or sneezed, could have been seconds before. And if you walk in, how is that not an aerosolized procedure? Or do you, do you think that is aerosolizing, coughing, sneezing? Yeah, of course, obviously. I mean, <laughs> to put it this way, it, does it make any sense to think, oh, an N95 is necessary for intubation, but if someone is coughing and sneezing one minute before you enter, and maybe you don't even know that, and in fact, they've been coughing and sneezing for the last hour, 
and before they were in that room, 10 other patients were in that room coughing and sneezing, that you can walk in there and think a surgical mask is sufficient. It's absolutely not, it's a joke. And so I think we absolutely need N95 masks at all times for healthcare professionals that are working with COVID-19 patients. Their lives are at risk and it's just an absolute tragedy that we don't have that as a mandate. What a great discussion. I mean, the reality is we face these types of decisions every single day, not just during a pandemic and definitely not just in healthcare. I wish that every single person in this world had the opportunity to go to university, but that's not the case. I wish that we all had a personal trainer and a chef so that we could make a difference in the rates of obesity, but we know those resources aren't there. So every day we're making decisions based on limited resources. And I'm hoping that out of this pandemic, we can start thinking about resources and which ones we never ever want to compromise on. Another way the virus is probably spreading is through asymptomatic carriers. So people who have the virus, but who have no symptoms and have no idea. I mean, could be me, I wouldn't know. That you can actually spread it asymptomatically. In fact, one of the things that uh, has become very ev evident with COVID-19 is that you can spread it through conversation. You don't need to cough on someone, you can just talk to someone and that it kind of goes through your airways and gets out into the space. Um, we also know that you, you know, touch your nose and your mouth, and if it's there, now I touch stuff, that I'm getting it on objects. Even though I'm not coughing, I'm actually getting it there with my hands. This is likely why many hospitals are moving toward universal masking, so everyone's wearing a surgical mask. In the hospital where I work, when you get there in the morning, you're given a little paper bag and there are two surgical masks inside it that you can use for your shift. There are some cool studies that have been done about surgical masks and coronavirus. They took patients who were sick with coronavirus and they just had them sit there and breathe. They weren't coughing, they weren't talking. And it turned out that they were spreading droplets and aerosols around them. They took the same patients, put on a surgical mask, and those patients did not spread the virus. But again, they weren't coughing. Another study looked at patients wearing surgical masks, but they were coughing, and it turns out that the virus was escaping the mask and still getting into the air. So this is why it's really important for us to still do physical distancing, even if people are wearing masks. Physical distancing. Okay, we know that it's working. We're seeing that the curve is flattening in many parts of the world but it's really hard to do in the hospital. I wanna say like even in the hospitals, it's hard to have social distancing. I don't know if you've had the same experience, but you know, you're at a nursing station and you've got to reach for things. It's almost impossible. You try to wait your turn, but you'll never get anything done. And people have to talk to each other, consult each other. It's been a real challenge in the last couple of weeks, personally, I, I, anyway. So I wonder yeah. if that- I, I totally agree, I totally agree. Distancing in a hospital is, is a joke. I mean, it's not- <laughs> It's not real, it doesn't happen, it can't happen for a lot of practical reasons. I think what we need is better PPE. So you can see there are a lot of issues at play here. Try to balance new scientific research with real limitations in our resources. But the good news is that our strategies and all of our efforts are really working. I'm hoping that this video will get us to start thinking about how to better protect our healthcare providers. We know there will be pandemics in the future, so will we be better prepared next time? I think we should start thinking about it now. So as a personal update, um, I'm starting two weeks of night shifts uh, where I'm seeing patients in the emergency department. So depending how busy it is, I'm really hoping to bring you guys along for some of those shifts. So don't forget to turn on that notification bell so you don't miss a video. Until then, stay safe, continue to do your physical distancing, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.